Hey, I'm Stefan Papadakis. We're here at the Engine Dyno today at Mountain in Carson, California. We've got our engine transported from our shop only about 10 minutes away over here. Got it all bolted up to the engine dyno and we're working on getting it started today. So let's get started. We've been working on this engine for a few months now. I'll link in the description below the teardown, all the parts we changed, and the build video. But for now, let's go dyno. So the dyno we're gonna use is a Superflow, and it's a 1500 horsepower capacity, 1200 foot-pounds of torque. And the way you couple the engine to the dyno is with this shaft, and it links the crankshaft to the power absorption unit and the measurement devices. But it took a bit of work to get our Supra engine mounted to the Superflow because they don't make a 2020 Supra dyno kit. <laughs> we had to actually make everything. So back at the shop, first thing we had to do was get the motor mounted onto the dyno cart. This cart allows you to move the engine around and also work on it a little bit as well. We fabricated a steel cross member that mounts to these rubber isolators to the Superflow cart. And that was pretty simple as far as mounting the engine to the cart, but now we had to figure out the output shaft adapter. The output shaft adapts to this clutch disc, but it doesn't have any friction surface. It actually bolts straight to your flywheel. And what we decided to do was make an adapter plate. The torque converter usually bolts onto the flex plate. We're gonna make this adapter. So after the design in the adapter, or I 3D printed it. It's flat on both sides because my 3D printer is not big enough to print the whole thing. And then we got this big chunk of aluminum and we're gonna go cut it out to the schematic. I started on the lathe. Because we're just building one, we decided not to go with the CNC. So I machined both sides of the round profile and then moved it over to the mill where we drilled and tapped the holes for the bolts. Now that it's all machined, you can see how it works where the adapter bolts to the flex plate and the dyno clutch disc bolts to our adapter. The next thing we had to make was an adapter from our 2020 Supra block to a small block Chevy bell housing. So I actually designed it and then our buddy down in San Diego, John Rusikoff, machined it all. We know that we may want to remove the bell housing often, so we're installing these steel inserts that lock in with these keys that you actually have to hammer in. That way you can remove the bolts many times and you're not wearing out the aluminum. These steel inserts are much longer lasting. Once all the parts were designed, we can go and bolt them up at our shop actually. That way it would be ready to go once we went to the dyno. First with the flex plate, then the adapter, then the Superflow clutch disc, and then and we can finally put the bell housing on. The transmission side of the bell housing is a standard racing transmission bolt pattern. So later on, if we put this in a car, it fits up to a lot of like G-Force and NASCAR and a lot of different type of racing transmissions. We'll bolt right onto this engine now. We also fabricated the intake pipe and just a basic bracket to hold the intercooler, as well as some bungs so we could put different temperature and pressure sensors before and after the intercooler and also before and after the turbocharger. Once we got the engine and everything over to Mountain, it took us about a day to set everything up. Because we're running a standalone engine management system and not running the factory computer, we designed an entire harness for the engine as well. This is how we're able to get the engine to run without the whole car, is we just use a standalone engine management system. We use the AEM Infinity, and that'll run all of the systems for ignition, boost, injectors, and everything we need to tune the engine to the powers we wanna make. But we couldn't get it started. We are adapting to some of the factory components. One of them is the factory ignition coils, and that took a little bit of development. We realized that we had to add an, an igniter in between the ECU and the coil, and once we did that, we got our spark, and then we were moving forward. The next is you want to sync the ignition timing. Okay, okay. clear. Yep. So if the ignition timing in the computer says 20 degrees before top dead center, we want to make sure that's actually 20 degrees on the engine. We got the drive-by-wire throttle body all set up, and then we start hooking up all of the sensors and also all the fuel lines. Another way that the engine works without the whole car around it is we have a fuel cell that holds our Ignite E85 ethanol fuel. Once we got everything all set up, the engine was started, and then we double check all the ignition timing with the engine running. <laughs> The way the dyno is set up for drive-by-wire cars, there's actually a throttle pedal mounted onto the dyno, and there's a cable that routes to that drive-by-wire pedal, and that's how the dyno controls the engine. After we got the engine running for a little bit, we noticed there was an oil leak. It was coming between the engine and the transmission, and after a little bit of investigation, we thought it may be the rear main seal. I must have made a mistake when I put it on or nicked it or something like that. So the next step was to pull the engine back off the dyno, but we didn't have to pull everything off. We were able to just move it away a little bit because all the lines are long enough. So we had to pull the adapter and all that stuff back off, change the rear main seal, and then put it all back together again. It was about another hour to, to swap that seal. Now that we had the engine oil leak fixed and the engine running smooth, it was time to start breaking in the engine. We put a basic tune-up in there and we started running the engine for about 15 minutes at different load levels to get the rings and everything all ready for big power. RPM pull, look at make sure everything is good and then okay, go from there. I'm gonna do it manually. Okay.
do visual. I went back in there and double checked everything visually, and we started doing some power runs. We're making, yeah, we're making like three pounds. first power pulls at high RPM, we did see some smoke, so we went in to check it out, and it turned out that the air conditioning compressor that we're leaving on there so all the serpentine belt works had a little bit of fluid that just shot out at high RPM. So then we zip-tied a towel in there, and that solved that problem, and we kept going for the day. First at low boost at 10 PSI, then 15, eventually making 850 horsepower on the first day on the dyno. And then we had the scariest moment up until this point. keep the setup relatively simple, we didn't use the direct injection and just use port injectors. What we learned is when you don't send fuel through the direct injector, the tip can overheat and we actually burned up the entire direct injector and compression was shooting out the open hole now since the direct injector was now exposed and it scared us and we thought we had a bigger issue and that pretty much ended our day. We realized we had to pull the head off, so right there on the dyno, decided to pull everything apart, see exactly what we had to fix and then go fix it. The best choice that we had was to seal all of the holes. So I went to my shop that Friday night, machined up some small dowels that we're gonna press into the holes where the direct injection enters the combustion chamber. Ah. Saturday morning, I went to Tom, my buddy does all of our cylinder head work, and we heated up the head on a barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do on a Saturday morning when you don't have an oven large enough for a super cylinder head. Uh, so we heat up the cylinder head to a little over 200 degrees so it expands the aluminum. And then we take our oversized dowels and we put them in liquid nitrogen to make them really cold to shrink them. And then we hammer them into the holes. And once the head cools down and the dowels heat up, there is a 2,000th interference fit and they're not going anywhere. We don't have to worry about those holes anymore. They're totally plugged. And then I could put the cylinder head back together and back onto the engine. By Monday morning, we're back at it again, trying to make our 1,000 horsepower. First 30 PSI, 35, then eventually 42 PSI. Before I show the last run, I wanna let you know that this is not the end of the story. The plan is to use this engine in something, a car in the future. So if you're interested in seeing that, please consider subscribing to the channel. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. So here's the last run. So now this should be 42 pounds of boost, 43. Yeah, it should be like 43, 40. Okay, so mon that last Monday was the red, just now was the black. Got it, okay. All right. So close again, but not there. What's happening now is we're trying to figure out why we're not making more power with the higher boost levels. On the other, on number three. So that's where we Shortly after we realized that the giant fan that changes the air inside the dyno room and keeps everything fresh air actually shut down. And once we went in, restarted that, we were able to make more power again. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Ah! Oh, hold on. We're going to show it right now. Here it is. There it is. Woo! Okay. The stress is <laughs> off a little bit. In a number. In a number. <laughs> This guy right. he's staring at that. I saw it! I saw it! <laughs> 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 our, our boost was back up at the end. Yeah. It yeah, was the, yeah, okay. It, it was the air. So we finally made our 1,000 horsepower. That was really stressful over the last few months. Going into the engine for the first time and never seeing inside of it and already having ambitious goals of trying to make 1,000 horsepower. Sharing the whole process and it's been a huge response. Thank you everybody who's been watching, enjoyed and commented on the videos and a lot of people I've actually gotten to meet at all of the shows. Thanks to all the companies and friends that helped with guiding me through this project. The parts we've made and the changes we made to the engine are all not just out of my head. I have a lot of smart friends and a lot of great companies we work with that helped us get to this goal. This was definitely a team group project. Thank you so much. We'll see you in the next video.